Today I am here to show support to the Immokalee workers on behalf of several organizations. I am here as a student from Boston University. I am also here as a um, member of Centro Presente, which is an immigrant rights organization. And I'm also here as a restaurant worker. I work in a restaurant called Taranta in the North End. And in our restaurant, we serve tomatoes. And we want to make sure that our customers enjoy the good flavor of a good tomato. But I don't believe that a tomato that was grown in unjust conditions has a good flavor. So I do not want to offer a tomato like that. I think that my, the customers that come to the restaurant where I work, they want to eat a good tomato that is not tainted by unjust labor. So we're here to ask Stop and Shop to pay attention to the Immokalee workers and sign the Fair Trade Agreement. Thank you. My name is uh, Jose Duarte. I'm the chef owner of Taranta Restaurant in Boston. Uh, we opened a restaurant 12 years ago, and our restaurant is a Peruvian Italian restaurant. We're a 30 seat restaurant in the middle of uh, Boston historic North End. Uh, for the last six years, we have been working really hard on trying to become very sustainable uh, and applying about 40 changes in our business practice to help the environment and make economic sense. We initially concentrated um, a lot with energy and water conservation. We um, use a lot of technology to minimize energy consumption so we can reduce our footprint um, by doing that. In, in the process of making these changes, we last year um, I was at a summit for Chefs Collaborative and I heard uh, Gerardo Reyes from the Immokalee Coalition of Workers in Florida to talk about how there is modern slavery. Let's, let me start by saying a little bit about where we come from. Imokali is uh, one of the poorest communities that exist in Florida, where the tomato industry, which is the most important also in Florida, is based. In this industry, we have seen a lot of abuses going on. Some of the abuses are stagnant wages since 1978, uh, getting 40 cents at that time per a bucket of 32 pounds of tomatoes, which means that in a normal day, a worker would have to pick two and a quarter ta tons of tomatoes in order to make just the equivalent of the minimum wage. And I, uh, I, was, I became very susceptible. I was like, I, I can't believe that that's happening now in the United States um, and how it's happening. So I basically discovered and realized that to be sustainable, you also have to count that human part. When we procure ingredients into a restaurant, we're totally forgetting that human element and that, that labor that goes into it. We uh, decided to, to learn and, and find out what can we do uh, as a restaurant and as, a, as chefs, as a chef and me and Christopher Titus, who's the restaurant manager, and Alex Calimberti, who is also a beverage manager in our restaurant. Um, we got together and said, well, we, we need to take a trip down to Mokali. And, and so um, we went down to Florida, uh, to Mokali, and we, we, we witnessed all these different uh, issues that involve the uh, farm workers. que es, uh, por ejemplo, el pago de la, de la vivienda, como ya lo mencionamos, es por semana, es por semana, y uno paga entre 50 a 60 dólares por cada semana. 
cada persona. Como esta, esta traila que está acá. Allí uh, por lo menos vivieron tal vez unas 12, 12 personas dentro de lo que es la, la vivienda. Tiene, tiene por ejemplo dos cuartos. ¿Quién es el dueño de esto? Acá en, acá en Imocali dos personas son dueños de la mayoría de, las, de los campos de vivienda. Well, seven, 720 dollars a week for a trailer like that. Multiply that, it's, it's like $2,500 a month. A studio apartment in, in the city of Boston would probably cost uh, $1,500 or $2,000. So this is actually costing more money than uh, a studio in the city. So it is a problem. Well, what Oscar was also explaining is that it's a problem with the really low wages, and that's kind of right. at the heart of everything is that if people were able to make a little bit more, they would have a lot more mobility. And part of the thing is people can't afford cars or transportation. Right, so so it's all live. concentrated in this nine block radius. Debajo de este, de este árbol es donde estaba el camión eh, donde los trabajadores vivían. La historia de este, de este caso es que los trabajadores estaban viviendo dentro de un camión de yuca. Ellos estaban pagando eh, como si ellos tuvieran, tuvieran una vivienda. Cada mañana, pues allí tenían que salir, los llevaban a los campos, regresaban, me, se volvían a meter allí y y el contratista eh, cuando cerraba el, el portón de, de atrás del camión lo, le, le, le ponía un candado afuera los trabajadores quedaban adentro ¿cuántos trabajadores? Uh, eran más que 12 trabajadores quienes vivían esas situaciones y entonces esa es como como breve la historia como lo de la como ellos se eh, por ejemplo, para bañarse los trabajadores tenían que pagar 5 dólares por una cubeta de agua. Entonces, uh, es una situación bien difícil la que se vivió, que sí la coalición estuvo involucrado para, para darle seguimiento, como investigarlo más profundamente uh -huh. y trabajar junto con la policía para procesarlo y llevarlo a la... ¿Lo procesaron o no? Sí, lo, se, se procesó esa, ese caso y se llevó en, la, en las cortes. Uh, donde hoy en día esos patrones están cumpliendo una pena de 10 y 12 años de cárcel. De cárcel. Wow. Well, the slave case, <clears throat> the slavery case was all over the local papers in southwestern Florida. Interestingly, it got almost no national coverage. Um, I, I think if there were a group of white children or something like that who were enslaved, it would have. But these were farm workers, um, and it had to be one of the most brutal slavery cases. Of, of the several, of you know, the dozen or more that have been uncovered down there. Um, and I, I mean slavery. I mean, we're talking about people being locked up at night, shackled in chains. We're talking about people being beaten for refusing to, for not working hard enough. We're talking about people being threatened with death or beaten very badly to the point of hospitalization for trying to escape. Um, it was slavery. It was, you couldn't, there's no euphemism for it. It wasn't indentured servitude or whatever you want to call it or human trafficking. It was slavery. You know, the same stuff that existed before the Civil War. I first heard about the coalition of Amakli workers through the Navarrete slavery case because they, paid, they played an important role in bringing that case and as it turned out several previous cases to light and eventually to justice. In that case, one of the escape, one of the slaves escaped and ran to the, the headquarters of the coalition of Mockley workers, where where they they took him to the authorities and, and, and protected him and made sure that that the authorities acted. They've been doing various actions to improve the working conditions um, for since the early 90s. So we're here at the office of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, and it's a community organization based here in Immokalee, Florida, which is kind of the tomato capital of the U.S. It's the hub where people meet every morning and get on buses to go out to the tomato fields and harvest the nation's tomatoes.
Mi nombre es Silvia, yo soy Silvia y soy de Guatemala. También soy una trabajadora del campo por muchos años, hemos trabajado en el campo y para una mujer trabajadora en el campo pues es un poquito duro. Yo conocí aquí la coalición por parte de, porque aquí los domingos hacemos junta de mujeres todos los domingos, que la junta es por dos horas, entonces es donde yo fui uh, conociendo y también todos los miércoles hay junta, para, junta comunitaria para todos los trabajadores. Y pues por ahorita yo estoy trabajando aquí en la coalición, pero en los, hace como dos años para atrás también yo estaba trabajando en el campo, piscando tomate, pero ahorita yo estoy trabajando aquí en la coalición y también estamos haciendo lo mismo para que los otros trabajadores llegaran a entender que un trabajador tiene su derecho de defenderse con, con los nuevos acuerdos que ahorita están implementando. Pues yo creo que necesitamos como ser más... Uh, más, más en grande para que las mujeres también llegan a entender eso y también las mujeres tendrían más tiempo de participar con nosotros o trabajar menos de tiempo o también que llegarían a pagar como o ganar un poquito más a lo que están ganando ahorita y eso es lo que necesitamos. Sabemos que Mokali es una comunidad donde Vienen muchos trabajadores de diferentes nacionalidades, por ejemplo, México, Centroamérica, a lo que es Haití también. Y es un poco difícil como poder llevar este mensaje. Y una manera que nosotros hacemos como compartir este mensaje, por ejemplo, los miércoles tenemos reuniones todos los miércoles a las 7 o cuando se oscurezca, cuando la gente ya está de regreso del trabajo. Lo que hacemos una de cómo difundir el mensaje un poco claro y mejor, a veces hacemos a través de un dibujo o a un teatro también o ver un video. Bueno, es algo que nosotros siempre hacemos nuestra comunidad, cómo llevar el mensaje y queremos empezar de qué, qué es lo que vieron al principio de la primera escena o quiénes son los personajes en especial. So this is something what you just saw, this is something we do in our community to educate each other. And so can we just start kind of like, what did you guys see? What are some of the characters that were in this theater? ¿Quiénes son los personajes? Who, who are the players here? Farm workers. Trabajadores. Y por ejemplo, después de un teatro donde se hace una reflexión con todos, y es una junta donde todos los trabajadores participen. Uno tiene que participar, como hacer preguntas y compartir y conectar con lo que es la vida real de un trabajador. Creamos una, una junta donde todos uh, comparten y, y crear una relación como entre amigos y como en cualquier compartir con amigos. Y la gente vuelve a, a ser parte de este grupo, como nadie puede ser no puede hablar porque no habla muy bien el español o no sabe muy bien o idiomas así o tienes miedo, sino que se hace una junta donde se mide que todos somos iguales. Y otra parte también lo que es la estación de radio, que es nuestra principal creo la comunicación con la comunidad. Y todos, no todos los trabajadores pueden venir, por ejemplo, en una reunión los miércoles, porque muchos, en muchas razones, a veces uno llega tarde, pero al siguiente día nosotros compartimos lo que pasó durante la junta, llevamos el mensaje, lo que pasó, y así todos estamos uh, en, el mismo, en la misma página. All right, so here we are in front of the headquarters of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. And we've been talking with Gerardo and with the workers all day and learning about their cause. And one of the things that they like to do with their visitors to demonstrate the type of physical work they have to do is that they like us to experience the lifting that they have to do. So this is one of the buckets that they use. So this bucket is filled with 32 pounds of weight, which is the equivalent of a bucket full of tomatoes. This is what they have to carry. On the span of a 10 hour workday, they have to lift this and walk the span of the whole field back and forth to the truck over 150 times and throw it back in the truck, lift it again, over and over. If you don't do it more than 150 times in 10 hours, you don't make minimum wage for that day. So this is something that they try to illustrate 
to the visitors here and um, I'm, I'm not that unfit of a person but this is pretty heavy and I'm pretty sure I couldn't do it for 150 times and it makes you appreciate the kind of work that they do to bring food to our table. The Coalition of Immokalee Workers began to organize in the early 90s to respond to some of the abuses that they were facing in the tomato industry. So it was really common in, back in that era um, for workers to be beaten um, and have physical violence, for a lot of um, workers, especially female workers, to suffer sexual abuse and sexual harassment. And so people began to get together, uh, workers began organizing and began um, meeting. The, their initial meetings were in the basement of a Guadalupe Catholic Church and they began to build this movement. There were regional strikes that happened in Imokali in uh, 95, 97 and 99 where over 3,000 workers uh, gathered and they, they were in a work stoppage for about a week. Um, in 96 there was uh, a march of around 500 workers they went to a crew leader's house marching after a worker was uh, brutally beaten in the fields for stopping to drink water. So that action was against violence in the fields and it worked. Um, we were able to stop or the CAW was able to stop the violence that was very prevalent on those years. And today that movement has grown into what's called the Campaign for Fair Food. The Campaign for Fair Food trying to bring the big buyers of tomatoes to do the right thing, to sit at the table, and we ask for three main things, to pay a penny more per pound that will be passed on to the workers in the form of a bonus that would address the wages, to establish a code of conduct that will guarantee that the rights of the workers would be respected when you go to work, to eliminate the abuses and to participate with willing companies from the tomato industry to create a different way of producing food. We started with Taco Bell. The last time you picked up some tomatoes at the store, did you think about the farmers that pick them? Well, there's another group in Southwest Florida that wants you to think about those workers. A couple of years later, McDonald's did the same. And it was because, because of the consumers. The consumers stand with us. Many of the protesters were farm workers, but dozens were students. More than 80 college students from across the U.S. also came out to the protest. Uh, as a member of the society, as a consumer of this food, um, to make sure that the people who provide this food for us are respected in the process. A little bit later came uh, Burger King, Subway, Whole Foods. The coalition of Immokalee workers reached an agreement last week with Subway the third largest fast food chain in the world and the biggest fast food buyer of Florida tomatoes. Subway now joins other fast food giants McDonald's, Taco Bell and Burger King that have all agreed to pay farm workers at least another penny per pound of tomatoes they harvest and improve working conditions. The tomato industry started to notice that change was on their way. Recently, the Obama administration recognized the Fair Food Program's cause is one of the most innovative and successful to date. And this group is hoping backing from the White House can make these large retailers change their tune. In Naples tonight, Julian Glover, Fox 4, in your corner. now we're implementing the fair food program in tomato companies that are participating with us um, also in a collaborative effort with 10 corporations that have signed agreements we were invited to share a little bit about the human element behind the food that's being prepared in uh, restaurant kitchens and to talk about the campaign and invite chefs to also talk about this and find ways to connect with the work they do uh, on Tuesday, we're going to have a presentation, a panel with uh, Jose Duarte, who's a chef who invited us. And in the panel, he's going to present with us also Barry Estebrook from uh, the writer of Tomato Land. And we're going to talk about farm workers uh, in the food chain. We're going to talk a little bit about how chefs can connect with the realities of workers at the bottom 
and just explore uh, possibilities of collaboration because we think that food uh, can only be good and considered good and sustainable if it includes uh, the workers too in the conversation. So we hope that chefs are going to get excited about participating with us. Since working so hard to make agreements on corporate levels, which we're not involved with, we can educate our customers and get them to help apply pressure to these different corporations that haven't come on board yet. In a system, there's many different parts. There's the role that consumers play, there's the role that suppliers play, there's the role that the corporations play, and each each component is integral to that system. And so here in this space, we're looking at a new sector, a new space, a new, a new ally group that can work towards systematic change. Restaurants are like temples, in a sense, for a community, for people to come together. And, um, and feed themselves and exchange ideas and, and uh, share culture. And, and, and so to not consider the human component of everything that's a part of a restaurant and what people consume, uh, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. So. As a restaurant professional, we learn how to do very skilled processes, how to work the produce and the food that we receive and that is a very skilled kind of labor but even before we get to do our job and receive the food and work on it somebody else already worked on it so that it can come from seed to table that is something that you don't think about often and you don't learn about we just consume it without even thinking about where it come from and this allowed the agricultural system to get so big we need more chefs, more people to, to, to join this cause, to help, so we can contribute somehow if it's one cent per pound. We, we have the capability of becoming more socially responsible by communicating these issues to our local community. And by creating awareness, we can make a substantial contribution to the campaign for fair food. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We begin today's show with the latest target in the push for fast food giants to buy their tomatoes through the Fruit Fair Food Campaign organized by the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. So far, McDonald's, Subway, Burger King, and Taco Bell have all joined the White House Recognized Social Responsibility Program. They've agreed to pay an extra penny per pound of tomatoes to raise wages and only buy from fields where workers' rights are respected. Now the delegation of workers has come to New York City to focus on Wendy's, one of the highest earning fast food chains in the country that so far refused to sign on.